say that about it. Because we're like, we're like, oh, we're like, Well, you can squeeze them in, but then you have a problem getting them. They're in my uh, tray in, in, in the vestry. Yes, in, in the window in the vestry.
مقام كمان دوام هيك I've not heard.
is taken from 1 Kings 17, verses 17 to 24. Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and think to kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, as you brought the tragedy, even on this widow, I am staying here by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the roof into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This is the word of the Lord.
conclusion on the experience that we have had. Uh, this morning we're going to be touching on what is a, a difficult topic, uh, maybe even quite a painful topic for us today, but I think it's an important one for us to address together as a community because uh, this has been a very painful period for many of us. And we need to be able to acknowledge that publicly and to, to grapple with that. It's obviously within one sermon, we're not assuming that uh, you know, everything's okay, but it is important for us to be able to think about the, the loss that there has been in this last period of time. Uh, of course, for, for some of us, that loss has been a person or people that we were close to. That pain has been uh, intensified by the, the inability to say goodbye in the ways that we would have liked. As many of you know, uh, my mum died uh, in January, uh, right at the beginning of this year. It was such a, a bizarre experience going through uh, that time of grief and loss. She was in the hospital in the days uh, before she died and uh, we weren't allowed to go and visit her. First thing we knew uh, was when I received a phone call uh, who told the day before things were improving uh, to say that uh, the, the nurses had been doing their, their warm rounds and Uh, after that, uh, we didn't, didn't visit. It was a few days until it was the funeral. Uh, we didn't meet with anyone. There were phone calls in between. So we just scurried out of the house for the first time for the funeral. The, the few of us were able to gather together. As soon as the service was completed, we had to leave and that's it, go back again. Not the only story that there is like that. Of course, loss that we may have suffered at any way in that period of time, but they've given new dimensions because of the experience that we are going through all together, nationally, internationally. And of course, we're all too conscious sitting here together as we gather, aren't we? That there's people that, that we're missing. Either. We didn't, as a community, get, get those opportunities that we would have wanted to, to say goodbye and to share in celebrating people's lives and all that they, they meant to us, to be with those people who were grieving. And of course, if, if our lives have not been touched by the loss of a person, there's been all sorts of other losses as well uh, that. Um, we have struggled with over this last period of time. Some people have been the loss of a job or, or an income. For many of us, there's been the loss of health that's kind of been accelerated, or the loss of freedom that we've experienced, the loss of, of confidence that maybe we had before, where things that seemed so easy and, and normal and natural before have suddenly become so much harder for us. There's been a lot of contact with family and friends, and people have suffered periods of intense loneliness and isolation. Each of us will have had our own experiences of loss in this last period of time. Each of us will need to be able to come to terms with those losses. My hope is that uh, as we spend this time as we look at this uh, next section on the larger list, there's an opportunity to first of all acknowledge that loss and also just maybe, maybe there's something here that will help us to reflect on those experiences that we have had. So only a beginning, as I said. Let's, let's look at what's been happening. Let's remind ourselves what's been happening. So, Elijah, Elijah, if you remember, he bursts onto the scene with this proclamation that uh, there's going to be this lockdown, there will be no rain in the land until he says so. And then as soon as Elijah arrives on the scene, he disappears again, he's sent off to 
this place that Kerak will be, where he's there cared for by the hand of God, fed by ravens. Sometime later, he moved, is moved to a new place. He moves into this place called Zarephath. Zarephath, interestingly, is not Israelite territory, it's home territory for, for Jezebel, the King Ahab's wife, who's been causing so much trouble in Israel. So he goes into foreign land, and there he meets a widow who is about to prepare a last meal for her and her son before they die. But then this miracle occurs. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord gives rain on the land. So they think it's all over. They think it's all over. There's enough there that they're going to be able to continue and to survive. But then everything suddenly gets worse. The sun becomes ill. He becomes warm and more unwell, and then he dies. The widow is devastated. She's absolutely distraught in her grief. She rails at Elijah. She says these words, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Now, remember that this is not the first time that this woman has faced death in recent months and weeks. In that earlier story, there's not the same sense of, of guilt and, and, and anger and grief that we hear here. What did she say to Elijah when she first met him? She says, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I'm gathering a huge pit to take home and make a meal for myself and my son. That we may eat it and die. That earlier time, there's, there's always this sense of, of resignation, but, but also a sense of faith. As surely as your God lives, as surely as your God lives, we may be about to die. But your God lives. But this time, in this new circumstance, everything is more. Or out there. What's changed in the meantime? What's changed is that she's experienced this miracle, isn't it? Her son has died over there. That, that jar keeps filling up with flour, and that jug keeps on filling up with oil. It's fascinating to me that it's almost as if this miracle suddenly makes things worse. How come your God, who's able to do this, hasn't stopped that happening? You can feel that confusion. This, this miraculous blessing suddenly made feels a bit like a taunt to her. I wonder if you know what that's like. You, you've experienced a situation where you've seen God miraculously break into the midst of it. But then there's another situation that happens. And then this time, things don't go the same way. This time, apparently, on the surface at least, the miracle doesn't happen. And maybe that's even more confusing. Why this time? Why not that time? The miracle that should sustain and should encourage us suddenly becomes almost a stumbling block to us. But then back to the story. Elijah gathers up the body son, Peter, upstairs. He prays. And the words we hear in prayer are remarkably similar actually to the words of the widow. They're probing, they're questioning. It's interesting, Elijah becomes the one who kind of takes these widow's pain and bears it onto himself and he takes it up to God. He bears this widow's pain for her. He shares that confusion that she had the sense that everything is wrong. Lord, my God, he prays, have you brought tragedy, even on this widow, I am saying, with, by causing her son to die? And then he does something that's, that's incredible. He stretches out on the boy's body three times. And he cries out to the Lord, oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life. 
a worldwide God. That destroys life. Verse 17. A worldwide God. That destroys life. Verse 17. It does. This scene is this is the very first time that we hear of someone being brought back to life uh, in the Bible. You and I live about 300 years of ages into the Bible at the moment. This is the very first time that someone has been brought back to life. Someone's res- resuscitated, not resurrected. Only Jesus has been resurrected, but he is brought back to those resuscitated, brought back to life. It's the first time that we, we, we hear of a story like this. In fact, in the whole of the Bible, there's really only eight stories where people are raised back. Life. So what's happening is incredibly rare, and we don't know, we don't know what's giving in our of this, this boldness to be suddenly praying this for this form. But what we do know is that something new and unique happens. And who does it happen to? It happens to this boy, we don't know what his name is. It happens to this boy who's the son of a widow. And nobody on the outskirts of the community who don't know what I've heard of this. It takes place in this place in Zarephath. It takes place not in Israel, in, in this holy land. It takes place out there, over there, somewhere, on enemy territory. It doesn't happen to someone who is important in our eyes. It happens to someone that we never hear anything about again in the whole of the Bible. We don't know what happens to that boy, what he goes on to do, how he lives his life afterwards before he dies again. This is who we're going to happen for. So, how about this story you can see to us in our lives at this time? Can this story that's all about someone coming back to life actually give us any hope in the midst of our losses? Although there are occasions for life where someone comes back to life, that's really, really rare. But nonetheless, I think that this story helps us. I think there's three ways that it helps us. We might be sort of carry on looking at this text as well over the course of the week. I'm going to invite you to reflect on it. I know that in the small groups, we're going to carry on looking at this passage as well. Um, and there's no way for anyone would like them to be able to do that themselves. But we're reflecting on this, and we might like just see three ways that I think it helps us. The first thing I way that I think this text helps us is that it says to us, let the green wind speak. The widow here is able to express what she needs to express. She has doubts, she has questions, she has fears, she has anxieties, and she's allowed to give them voice. It's so important to recognise that the miracle that follows is in no way hindered by the fact that she expresses all of those things. At no point does she ever criticise for her outburst of anger at Elijah and his God. She isn't told off for what she expresses and what she experiences. Now I'm not just, I'm not an advocate that kind of just go and have a good shout at God and you can even take it, you know, go, go and do that. I do think, though, that this, this passage suggests to us that we can take whatever we are experiencing to God. It also, I think, invites us as we look at Elijah to see that together we are able to bear those questions to God Himself. We can help one another carry those questions to God, to bring them to Him. As a community, we can do that. It's okay to do that. To come and give voice to those things. We don't have to suppress our thoughts and feelings. We bear them with one another to the Lord. So let the reading speak. I think there's a warning within here too, isn't there? That we cannot then, though, let our feelings become our theology. Don't make your feelings become your theology. In, in our loss, in our disappointment, in our confusion, in our anger, we can make all sorts of wild assumptions about God. But we can't.
cannot let those assumptions become our convictions. Uh, we cannot make allow them to become our convictions. We need to be careful that our losses don't suddenly shape our theology. We may fear in the midst of our loss that we have learned something about who God is. But those things that we suspected about him that is his pickle. Uh, that he's punishing us, we've done so to provoke him. We may feel that we've learned those things, but we haven't actually learned those things. Our feelings about God and the reality of who God is are not the same thing. Our feelings are not our theology. But we do nonetheless learn the same vital about God in this story. Something that's absolutely crucial. Me in the midst of this time. And that's this. God has no boundaries. God has no boundaries. This, in a way, is the, is the whole message of this first part of the story of Elijah. Uh, God crosses every single border. At the beginning of the story, we see God taking Elijah out into the wilderness. And out in the wilderness, there he gives life to Elijah in the midst of the desert. Then what we see, we see this movement of space Zarephath, deep into Baal's territory, into enemy territory, apparently. And in that place, there God performs a miracle of provision. Now, in this story, what do we see? We see that this God goes over the border into death itself. And in no place, can he be stopped? There is no impenetrable areas for this God. There are no no-go areas. Yahweh never retreats. He never suffers a setback. He is never frustrated. There's nothing that can hold him back. There are no limits to the boundaries that he will not cross. And there is no one who learned that he will not cross those boundaries for. If he crosses them for this, this boy from a foreign land, there's nobody that we learn nothing about. There is no one that God will not cross those boundaries for. And if Jesus Christ is there, I'm not there. This then is our deepest hope. Our God will not allow our loss to become the defining feature of our lives. Our loss is not a no go area for the Lord. God is not confined by our loss. He has come to work in the midst of it. Not
to peace. To crown all things, there must be love, fine all together and complete the whole. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. The peace and love of the Lord be always with you. And, and also with you. So on that side of that peace. Peace with you, everybody. Peace with you, everybody.
this is slightly different to the other thing that's um, we're offering the point as well. Of course, they wanted to limit the translation, so he's a bit traffic. And then we're going to do this time scale, which is kind of like a very long size of the thing. Up to now. So, So the end is ready, and then we'll be moving the tail out of the way in the microphone. And we'll just come up and see how we can see the end of the other strands. But as we're standing in the middle, we'll be having a wave this way. And there's someone on the side of me on my right, and the person is the mouth. The Spirit is with us. We live thanks to the Lord. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you took flesh 
as your son born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about in arms. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you, and say, Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, and Son in our hearts. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grounded by the power of your Holy Spirit, and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave it thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave it thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this not only to drink it, in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and the resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. This perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for granting us work to stand in your presence. And serve. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your people all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, in honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come, your, your will be done, on earth and in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. No, no, no. Because we all share And one knows I didn't give out earlier. You know, it's not to um, dip the way it seems in the line. You know, one or two people have put things in that pamphlet. It actually isn't any, any um, else you're really saying, but actually, it's just regarding the words. So, I don't take the one, 
Since I cannot now receive your sacramental, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart, O Christ of the Holy friend and brother, now I pray you all clear, love you all day, and follow you all day. Amen.
strengthen them for service for all the hands as I take them through these names. May the ears which have heard your word be deaf to come with this peace. May the tongues which have sung your praise be free from deceit. May the eyes which have seen the tokens of your love shine with the light of faith. And may the bodies which have been fed with your body be refreshed with the fullness of your love. Glory to you forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. So us out in the power of your spirit to live and work as your praise and glory. Amen. Uh, just to say, uh, if there is anything that is on your hearts and minds at this time, uh, as you raise through the service, and uh, then you appreciate to talk through with someone or to pray about, uh, please don't leave this place today without making um, sure that you grab someone and speak to them and uh, yeah, take this opportunity. But for now, the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord will come to you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. 